It all started with the codfish. White men reportedly discovered Bering Sea cod in 1857 when a cargo vessel bound for Siberia was stymied by ice. Crew members tossed fishing lines over the side in search of fresh food. They soon feasted on a fish that had long been a staple of the European diet but was believed to inhabit only Atlantic waters. The sailors had discovered not just the Pacific codfish, but one of the world's great continental shelves, a huge expanse of shallow water roiled by currents that cause constant upwelling of nutrients from the ocean bottom and stir the mixture into a rich, biodiverse soup. It may be the most productive ocean ecosystem in the world. The Bering Sea, I think, is probably as rich a fishing ground as any place in the world. There's just no doubt it's a very, very productive piece of real estate. Alaska's offshore waters would one day become the scene of global competition over resources that have replenished themselves with astonishing profusion despite decades of intense commercial fishing. This abundance would convince a reluctant United States government to sign the Law of the Sea Treaty that extended national boundaries to 200 miles offshore. The economic opportunity it represented changed the way we manage the ocean. Within a generation of the discovery of the Pacific codfish, a new industry would be born. Then, as now, Seattle was its hub. In the beginning, sailing ships left Seattle with flotillas of dories nested on deck. Even on remote northern oceans in the early years, fishermen sat and hauled their gear from the tiny dories. Ed Shields followed his father, Captain J.E. Shields, into the cod business. The family's Pacific Codfish Company was established on Puget Sound in 1911. Father, then son, would rank as the last remnants of the age of working sail on the northwest coast, plying the waters from Seattle to Alaska until 1950 aboard sailing ships rigged for cod. I first became involved with going to sea with him in 1934 on a four-mast schooner, Sophie Christensen. Uh, this schooner could bring down almost 700 tons of salt-cured fish. Their fleet included the smaller ships Charles Wilson and C.A. Thayer. Sophie Christensen was the largest one that was in the cod fishing fleet and she carried 22 dories. The Thayer had carried 18 dories um, in earlier years and Charles Wilson about 14 dories. 19th century fishermen propelled themselves with sails and oars and hauled their gear by hand. By the 1930s, a technological quantum leap provided the dorymen with little engines. The fishing day started at 4 a.m. with breakfast on the schooner. The fishermen would crank up their engine, one man to a dory, and run out maybe two miles, maybe five miles, to where each one of them thought was a place worth trying for the day. Uh, they would be very careful that they would never go to leeward of the vessel, so that if the engine broke down, uh, they would not have to roll the dory back against the wind. Each fisherman worked two lines, one on either side of the tiny boat. If he could catch a halibut, that made the best bait. Otherwise, he cut up a small codfish. There would be a five-pound weight on the end of each line and two or three hooks. And they would jig the uh, lines over the side when the fish bit, uh, bring the line in, take the fish off the hook, put it in the after fish hold of the dory and cast the uh, line overboard again. Twice each day, the dorymen offloaded their catches. The fishermen would come back around 9 to 10 o'clock in the morning and unload the first catch of fish, uh, come aboard, have their dinner, which is the heavy meal of the day, and then go out for the second trip of fishing, coming back about 4 o'clock with a second trip. Uh, the best day that I can remember on the Sophie Christensen, we had almost 17,000 fish. They would average uh, 12 to 14 pounds, so 
On that day, we caught nearly 200,000 pounds of fresh fish, which is no small deal.